Thank you, Randy, and thank you to the World Affairs Council here. It's truly an honor and truly a privilege to be here with all of you. Uh, being active in the World Affairs Council, I realize why your organization is very, very important. Um, you know, when I was talking to Randy before, I was telling him the world is really getting closer and closer and closer. And whether you're in Denver, you're in Delhi, or you're in Dubai, it's basically a click away. So what you are doing in terms of the grassroots of understanding how our world is interconnected is very, very critical. So really thank you for what all of you do every day with the World Affairs Council because I know this is a very important work. And I'm going to try to give you a perspective, my perspective on the past, the present, and the future, and then try to basically ask and answer in my way, but also ask you why does this all matter, why does India matter to us uh, in the beautiful city here, or to me uh, in Washington, D.C., or to anywhere else. Um, when I talk about the past, I am going to basically talk about from 1947, which is when India got independence, to 1992. And you wonder why the past is only till 1992, because 92 is when India really started opening up to the rest of the world, the economy, the culture, the interaction with the West. And present is basically 92 to 2010 current, and then beyond. And we look at some key factors in India. I'm talking about the political factors, the socio-economic factors, uh, foreign policy, and those kinds of factors that determine a nation. And to even complicate it a little further for you, we have a few clips of people who are leaders in India, not, well, maybe there's a politician, but they're business people or just people who are making the India of the future, and we're going to try to hear from them directly rather than the guy whose voice is a little hoarse uh, from his son's basketball team. I should have known better that I was coming here. <laughs> but um, uh, I apologize for that. Um, so, Randy has told me about all the technological gizmos, so I'm going to uh, try to see if I can make this thing work. But um, one thing I did want to mention to you, my assistant was asking me, your voice is hoarse, why you want to travel all the way to Denver? And I said, that's the least I can do for the great city that has sent us Mike Shanahan as a coach of the Washington Heights. <laughs> so, thank you so much. <laughs> but um, coming down to going away from Broncos and Redskins, for which we could argue for the rest of the evening, but, um, you know, talking about India, uh, you know, this is an interesting date. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. This one, okay. Um, you know, March 18th, which is tomorrow, 1922, is a very significant date in the history of India. That's when Mahatma Gandhi was known as the father of the nation, the apostle of peace, or whatever your perspective is on Mahatma Gandhi, uh, was first sentenced to a six year sentence by the British on that day. And that kind of snowballed into the freedom uh, for India from uh, the British. And on August 15, 1947, India achieved freedom, and it's ironic that I'm here on that day. Um, okay. I talked about India having a closed economy, or a closed society, and that kind of goes into the genesis of what gave birth to India. If you think about the leaders of India after 1947, they had serious scars of the British because the British came into India through the East India Company and under the guise of doing business with India. So when India got independence in 1947, they said, no more foreign trade, no more deals like East India Company, we are going to be working on self-reliance and we are going to be having a closed economy. And unfortunately, history usually is a good indicator of the future, but in this case, it was not because India should have had a more open economy, it should have had more choices for the consumers. But when you look at Indian economy, and that's with the past until 1992 when they started opening up, their average growth rate was 1.5%, and their population was growing around 2%. So the challenges for India, in that entire period that you see on the left-hand side, India doubled its GDP in 45 years. It took them 45 years for per capita income to double. Now when you look at that other bar, now India with its growth today 
is doubling its per capita income every nine years. So if you are an Indian, your income is doubling every nine years from a per capita perspective. And that's what a closed economy and an open economy can make a difference. I'm going to have um, this gentleman who runs Motorola. Um, let's see if we can try to do this. Okay. Um, this gentleman, he runs um, Motorola mobile phones, one of the largest phone companies. He grew up in India. He's going to talk to you a little bit about what it was like growing up in the past in India, which was the closed economy in terms of consumer choices. I hope you can hear what he has to say. Yes. You know, my dad was a doctor in India. He left to go to the UK to do uh, an advanced degree in Marseille, member of the Royal College of Physicians. And uh, I, I remember, um, one of the things I remember well was uh, uh, that we didn't have a phone uh, in India. Our next door neighbor had a phone. And so when my dad would call, would, would, would get a yell from across the house and uh, we'll go over and talk to my dad. Because this worked fine, as, as believe it or not, as a mode of communication. But one day, we, we used to play cricket outside uh, our home. And one day, um, a friend of mine, I, I still maintain it wasn't me, hit a, hit a six that went over the fence. And my neighbors were sitting, having tea, and it kind of apparently fell and caused, it destroyed it. The tea part or whatever it was. But that, with that went our uh, phone privilege too. <laughs> and uh, so, so my grand, we were living with my granddad at that time. And so my granddad decided that he wanted to get phone service because uh, you know we needed to talk to my dad who was in the UK. And uh, I, I remember it took us two summers to get the phone service in our home because they had to. Dig, pole, dig holes and put poles in, and that summer we had a flood in India. Um, and I, I think my interest in telecommunication really rose a little bit out of that. I know how important that was to us. Well, Sanjay is making an interesting point. He said it took him two years to get a phone. In my case, in most cases, obviously, maybe Sanjay had some special relationships. It was an average of 10 years that it would take to get a phone, and you had basically two choices of cars, Ambassador and a Fiat, which was an Italian uh, manufacturer. But Sanjay also was talking about a game called cricket, the hitting the six, which is, if you're fond of baseball, it's like a home run for baseball. You know, people talk about many religions in India. The main two religions in India are cricket and Bollywood. <laughs> so, and very important for people who are going to visit India. It's an all-year sport, just goes on, and on and on, unlike baseball, which has a season. But anyway, um, India at that time in the past, the foreign policy was being non-aligned, but de facto India was aligned with the Soviet Union. And for military reasons, for economic reasons, and the United States was aligned with Pakistan because they considered Pakistan to be a counterweight to pro-Soviet Union. There was one seminal event that happened which still very recently was a determining factor in the mindset of the Indian foreign policy bureaucrats was during 1971 when there was a war for liberation of Bangladesh, President Nixon sent the 7th Fleet to the Bay of Bengal and every Indian bureaucrat till, because now most of them are now retired and there is a generation that has grown up without remembering this, always remembers that the Americans sent the 7th Fleet to threaten us. So this is the mindset that you're seeing that was there in the past of being more aligned towards Soviet Union and having a suspicion of the West, which obviously has changed at the present time. National security, if you look at the history of India, India's had during that period four wars, and three with Pakistan and one with uh, China, and one in 1999 with the Kargil War. So India has had territorial challenges. Part of it was because the way India was born, the British carved Pakistan out of India based, according to them, on religious or whatever other conditions. And that's a long discussion that we could spend hours on talking about uh, the formation of Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc. 
But that was the territorial issues that have been going on have plagued India for a long period. And India also has had territorial issues with China, and we'll talk a little bit about that. From a political structure standpoint, till very recently, it's been dominated by one party, which is the Congress party, which is a party which was pre-independence, it's a over 100-year-old party, which has been kind of a dynasty. When you look at the gentleman on my extreme left, Jawaharlal Nehru, he was the first prime minister, and then his daughter, which is on the extreme right, became the prime minister, then her son became the prime minister, and the current leader of the party is her daughter-in-law, and now her grandson is getting ready to maybe, maybe assume a position of leadership. But the Congress party has been historically been the dominant party, but that is now changing uh, as we move to the present times. As we move to the present times, one seminal event that happened in 91-92, the Cold um, War got over and the Iron Curtain came down. India was closely allied with the Soviet Union, so its economy also took a big hit. And what happened was, India ran out of foreign exchange. In 1992, India had to give 67 tons of gold to IMF because it didn't have any foreign exchange reserves. And part of the conditionality that IMF had was, you better open up your markets if you want our financial aid and financial support. And India started opening up after 1992, which was Narsimha Rao and Manmohan Singh. And since then, India has not looked back in terms of reforms that have happened. And the opening up of markets, allowing foreign direct investment into the country, privatization of public sector uh, companies, all those things have happened despite different parties running the country that tells you that reforms have now taken hold and they will be there for the long future. This is now what happened after 1992. And all indications are on the go. From a country which had basically to mortgage gold because of its foreign exchange reserves, India is sitting over 300 billion in foreign exchange reserves. Its GDP is now over a trillion dollars. And it's doing well on all accounts because it unleashed the entrepreneurs in India. It unleashed the consumers in India. And that's where the movement for the growth really started happening. And people always talk to me, they say, hey, uh, you know, uh, India is a very big in terms of the back office, or India has got the IT folks. How did that happen? Well, you know, how it happened was, I don't know if some of you remember now, in late 90s, we had what was called the Y2K scare. And guess what? Most companies around the world were looking for English speaking, people who knew computers who could mechanically go through millions of lines of code and change 99 to 2000. And guess what? Indians raised their hands and said, here we are. And Indian companies got their start really because of Y2K. And you look at these companies, they were born around that time. They did about $5 billion in business at that time. And this year, these companies clocked over $50 billion in revenue because once they had done the Y2K work for all these companies like Coca-Cola and other companies globally, they said, hey, can we do something else? Can we do more? But everybody needs a start. India was in the right place at the right time for them, in the wrong time for us, because nothing happened in Y2K, as we all know. <laughs> but an uh, industry was born and technology in India being the back office of the world was born. And simultaneously, during this exchange rate crisis, you have a large Indian diaspora, people like me and many, many others like Sanjay. There are 30 million of us outside India. And they relatively have done well because the joke always is, every time you send an Indian out of India, he does better than he does in India. But <laughs> that's changing too. But last year, Indians outside India sent 50 billion back in terms of contribution back to the country, remittances, foreign remittances. And when the country was in foreign exchange crisis, a lot of people, Indians who were living outside, sent a lot of money back to make sure that the country could stay afloat. On the foreign policy front, India has not just opened up its economy, it's changed its foreign policy also. 
It has gotten much, much closer to the West. Today, United States is its largest trading partner. We're doing about 50 billion in trade. India is one of faster growing uh, export markets for the United States. There is a lot of defense cooperation. There's the famous US-India nuclear deal, which allowed India to become a recognized nuclear power uh, for civil nuclear purposes. They are doing joint military exercises, joint naval exercises. India is in the verge of signing a free trade agreement with the EU. It's also doing a free trade agreement with the ASEAN countries, the countries in Asia. So India is now confident that East India days of the memories of the British are long gone. It believes it can really work, trade, and deal with countries outside. Now it's part of the G20, which has basically replaced the G8, a group of countries that, um, so to speak, are the important countries in the world, according to some definition. National security, India still faces internal challenges. Um, some of you uh, probably remember the attacks in Mumbai that happened uh, around Thanksgiving a uh, year and a half ago in 2008 where the most important city in India, which is Mumbai, was basically held at siege for four days by terrorists. It's also had its parliament attacked. So there has been continuous acts of terrorism like we face in the United States and the threat of terrorism that exists. And India is beefing up its homeland security on the backgrounds of what we are trying to do. But there are still, because of a coming out from a closed economy, there are still a lot of social and infrastructure challenges that currently face India. You know, all of you obviously have this perception about India as these scientific geeks or these great uh, IIT institutions, etc. But a country of 1.1 or 1.2 billion people also has 20% of people only going past secondary <coughs> education. You have 60% of its population still living in villages, contributing 16% to the GDP which is shrinking share. Last year, 13,000 farmers committed suicide because guess what? Those farmers were relying on the monsoon. They had a bad monsoon. They couldn't pay their loans. Now, things are changing. Mechanization is coming in. But still, corruption is a challenge that still faces India. It's ranked number 70 on the list of Transparency International in terms of corruption. So a legacy of problems but solutions are starting to come in with new leadership, new openness, and the economic growth that India is beginning to see. And the video here uh, is of this uh, young lady who is the leader in parliament of the National uh, Congress Party. She's a future leader. Her father is one of the top leaders in the country. Here she's talking about education, and it's interesting to see uh, the question I asked her was, what does she think about the education system in India? I think what we really need to do is we have to have, we need to do much more skill development. Because what is happening is we have a lot of educated youth, but we need to study. That's what I earlier said also, that we need to change our education a little. It has to be more job oriented. You'd be surprised, but I have tested this that there are kids from the 10th standard who don't even know how to write a check. They are educated, they know how to read and write, but there is no practical education. I think that is a bit of a change we really need to bring. And we have to find a medium where we have to do more job development. I don't know how we will achieve that. Maybe because optimization is another big challenge ahead of us. Factories which needed 800 people, say even 15 years ago, today are running on say 200 people. That's a big challenge ahead of us. What Supya is talking about is there are educated people, but they don't have the skills in many cases to be employed. The employability of educated people is a big challenge. Well, also, we shot this video while she was driving a car. And the other challenge is that there are enough potholes that are uh, uh, kind of <laughs> making the video a little bit jerky. But that's an infrastructure issue. We won't go there right now. So what is the political structure now in India? You still have the Congress party. Sonia Gandhi is the leader. She's an Italian-born Catholic, a Roman Catholic, who basically is the leader of India, who stepped aside for Manmohan Singh, who's the Sikh gentleman in a country which is 82% Hindu. This could only happen in India, who was given the oath of prime minister by a Muslim president. And then you have the main opposition party, which is the Bharatiya Janata Party. It's the right of center party. 
if I were to give you some comparisons to the United States, and again, with, again, I'm taking a little bit of literally, this would be the Republican Party and that would be the Democratic Party. Now, the Democrats and the Republicans in this building, please, I'm taking a little bit of literally uh, liberty here. So these are the two main parties, but what has happened really, and this is what I think that this map kind of alludes to is, federalism is breaking apart in India. Regional parties have risen and you see that only 12 states are now ruled directly by Congress and BJP. The rest is basically coalitions and alliances and regional parties. So when you think, okay, I'm going to do business with India, I'm going to go to Delhi and I'm going to sign a deal. Well, think twice because states have a lot more power and sometimes they don't listen to what Delhi does. Just like I'm sure people in Denver don't always like to listen to what Washington says. But here it's a little more complicated because you have a couple of states being run by the communists and many other regional parties. So regionalism is growing and it has its challenges, but also it gives voice to the aspiration of a country that is diverse with 22 languages and all kinds of religions and all kinds of cultures in there. So let's talk about the future, which is what really is the exciting part, is what is the future of hold for India? Now, you talk to any economist, um, they all will tell you that at certain some point, you now you could argue on the years, this is, let's say 2050, India will be the third largest economy after China and the United States. Indians say on a purchasing power parity, we are already the fourth largest economy. But it is going to be a large economy. And what I think is very, very interesting with India, which is a little bit different than China, it's an economy driven by entrepreneurs, unlike in China, which is driven by the state. So you see institutions, they have a very strong banking system historically, a very strong stock exchange historically. And that's the foundation of its economic growth. Obviously, it's still got a long way to go as far as China is concerned, but India is on the march. There's no question. If you go to India, as I go every often, every three, four months I go, I see changes there. It's unbelievable the entrepreneurs that they're producing. And that's the power of India. India will also be the most populated nation in the world. That also everybody agrees. You can argue it might be in 2030, some people say 2034. But it will be already one out of six people in this world is an Indian. Maybe it'll be one out of five. Um, but there's a couple of facts that are not clear here. India is the youngest nation in the world. 500 million people in India today below the age of 25. And there are over 700 million people below the age of 35. Just imagine in an aging Europe, aging Japan, even China has a, with the one-child policy is starting to age, and especially con our country here. So India has a huge demographic advantage that exists if it can harness its youth. 500 young people, now if you talk to TV um, channels, they'll say, hey man, that's God's demographic because they all want to sell to those people. And with education happening and income growing, India is going to have a tremendous demographic advantage. I remember growing up, India used to, they used to always say, we are a country of one billion problem because we have a billion people. Now they say we are a country of 1.2 billion opportunities. The mindset has dramatically changed in India. They regard this as a strategic advantage moving forward uh, in the world in many, many different areas. This is um, a gentleman who's probably one of India's um, most recognized and reputed businessmen. If you, and some of you have been to India, if you have seen the scooters in India, they all have his name on it. Now he is also a member of parliament and his specialty is he minces no words. And you're going to hear him talk about some of the challenges India faces. The two major issues much more important than opening up of economic opportunities further are uh, one, better governance. We have very poor governance, a lot of inefficiency and a lot of corruption. So there is no easy answer to that. I, don't, I have no solutions in the short term, especially. In the long term, a strong government, a strong prime minister can maybe start that process. Secondly, we are absolutely short of infrastructure, physical and social, roads, 
therefore, power in social infrastructure, you have education, health, clean drinking water in every village, sanitation. These are much more important. Well, Rahul Bajaj talks about the challenges that India faces, and I think India is addressing a lot of them. Everywhere now you go to India, every time I go, there's massive construction just like in China happening. Massive roads are being built, bridges are being built, they privatize ports, so new airports are coming up. So I think changes are happening, but not fast enough because India is a democracy. Democracy is probably the best form of government, but it's the most difficult form of government too. India has rules, laws, unions, all kinds of other uh, things that exist. Talking about national security, one of the biggest concerns that India has, and this, is, this has got to do with China, that India believes that China has a string of pearls approach to it. If you look, and I will try to see if I can. These are uh, the oil shipping lanes that India uses to transport oil. And these are all the places that China has now either built a port or set up some kind of a base. So India believes that if it ever has any kind of transgression with China, because it has still got a big border dispute going on with China, it could disrupt its oil uh, supply. India imports 65% like we do here of all its energy needs. And it definitely needs those energy needs. This gentleman is uh, one of the most respected businessmen in India. All, a lot of trucks, a lot of infrastructure, uh, information technology. He's even got a hybrid SUV coming to a store near you in a two months called the Scorpio. Uh, question that we posed to him was, what does he see as the biggest challenge to India's economic growth? And the surprising answer you will get, he's a Harvard Business School educated. Basically, Anand was asked, what does he think can derail India's march because it's been going at the rate of 7% and they projected to go at 9%. And his answer basically was, he doesn't see anything from the economic standpoint that could stop India's march. He says, whether it's interest rates or things like that, he says, those are things we can control. But he says, the thing that keeps him up at night, maybe, <coughs> Okay, the thing that keeps him up at night, he says, is the black swan, as he called it, if you get a chance to see it. He's really a very smart uh, gentleman, is India's neighborhood. India, according to him, and according to most Indians, lives in a very tough neighborhood where it's got problems all around its neighborhood. And I'm going to just point to you uh, some of the countries that India is surrounded by. Historically, it's had challenges of territory with Pakistan. Nepal has a Maoist government and have got all kinds of internal problems going on right now. It's got a border with Burma, which is foreign territory in regime, and fighting an ethnic uprising there. Bangladesh has an Islamic fundamental uh, problem going on right now, and there have been uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 million Bangladeshis that have crossed into India for the border. And then Sri Lanka has had, for the past 20 years, an ethnic battle going on with its Tamilian population. So, what most Indians worry about is the blowback from their neighbors coming in. And so, India is really engaged in working with its neighbors to see whether trade, opportunity, all those things can really enhance and create a real uh, stable neighborhood for India. And I think it is going to be incumbent on India uh, for it to have a stable Pakistan, a peaceful Pakistan, a peaceful Nepal, a peaceful, and obviously I didn't mention the 800 pound gorilla, which is China out there for India. Um, all those countries, incidentally, China is India's second largest trading partner of the United States, so it's got tremendous trade activity going on, but still a very, very tough and dangerous neighborhood that India has. So the question obviously that comes um, across is, why does India matter? And it could be, is it because 
It's got huge population. It's got a huge economy. It's got a um, big army. It's got nukes. Or it's got um, good soft power. It's got Bollywood. It's got cricket. And I don't think so. Because a lot of countries have that. But what India has, which if you go back, and if you go back to the map, if you can just one step back, and which is what a lot of speakers here, from what Randy tells me, are talking about the Middle East, the challenges of Islamic fundamentalism, etc. If you look, and if you can, if you ever had a map of the world, only democracy that exists in that region. Yeah, we're, we're yeah, grab that so, uh, the only democracy that exists in that region, and for your information, it has the second largest Muslim population in the world. Second largest Muslim population in the world. And practically every religion in that country. Living to a large extent peacefully. So if India, to me, is a laboratory or an experiment of what can be, the future, what can be the future for a lot of those countries, if democracy takes hold, if living in peace in a multicultural region takes hold for other countries in the Middle East, and it becomes an example, then India is going to truly matter. And India will matter to you because our way of life is under attack to a certain extent. I was telling Randy, you know, flying is not fun as much as it used to be, especially if people are basically stripped down. But our life has changed, literally has changed for many, many things that we do. And India can show the way to the world. In a country where the president is a Muslim, it doesn't matter. The number one actor is a Muslim, one of the top IT companies head is a Muslim. Uh, 150 million Muslims living in a country where 80% plus people are Hindu to a large extent peacefully. And if you go there, you'll see a church, a mosque, um, in a temple living side by side. If that is possible in India, then it should be possible in the rest of the Middle East. And a lot of the countries there need to take that example. So to me, India matters because it is the laboratory of what the future looks like for the rest of the world. Because if this problem is not solved, whether you call it Islamic fundamentalism, black tolerance, etc. No matter what kind of economy we have, no, no matter what kind of gadgets we have, none of those things are going to matter unless we have peace and peace with all kinds of religion. I think that's what India provides and that's why India truly matters. And India matters to you. And I will leave you with the, the last slide, which is the past, the present, in the future and talking about stereotypes. The past stereotype, the snake charmer, who still exists in India makes a still a decent living. The current stereotype, the call center person who has probably been the Ian or Richard answering your calls or your telephone bills or your credit card bills. And then that's the future, the nano car, the two thousand dollar car made by India for the people, for a family of four, because they are driving around on scooters in an unsafe manner. A wife, a mother carrying two kids in her arms. And so they, Tata made that car, and probably coming to a home somewhere near you in the far future. <laughs> so that's the past, the present, and the future. So India is changing, but with change, it's important that India succeeds for all of us. So thank you very much for having me here. I will enjoy it. You know, that's an excellent question. India has historically had a, a huge problem with the scheduled costs because the cost system is very heavily been prevalent in India. And um, there are still many, many situations where they are oppressed and violence is committed against them. But what you're trying, beginning to see is when you see the biggest state in India, which is Uttar Pradesh, with almost 200 million people who uh, live there. The chief minister of that state happens to be a Dalit. Today the speaker of India happens to be a Dalit, backward class. And there's also reservations now
for seats in schools, colleges, medical colleges, as well as in government jobs, and now also in commercial enterprises for them. That doesn't mean the problem's solved. That means the problem's being, at least being made, people are being made aware of. Only solution to the problem is education, education, and education. And I think that's what India really needs, because the next generation of people need to grow up thinking like we all do, all human beings are equal. Any next questions over here? Yes, um, I realized that Slumdog Millionaire uh, was a movie. However, I'm very concerned about the poverty, uh, and which seems to accompany that kind of growth, dramatic growth. Uh, how, how many, what percentage of people really are in dire straits in India? You know, poverty is um, a serious problem in India if you Obviously, you talk about slumdog millionaire. You know, the irony of India is um, the two people who are in the top ten uh, list of the wealthiest people in the world, two of them happen to be Indian. One of the gentlemen is building a home, the most expensive home in the world. It's going to be about a billion dollars in Mumbai. <laughs> and just down the street from him is, guess what? A slum. So, I think Poverty is a fact, it's a reality. 70% of people, depends on the statistics you use, live in poverty at certain stage um, in India. But with the economic reforms, what has happened is India has, in the past 10 years, taken 100 million people out of poverty. And India needs to continue to grow at least at a minimum of 7%. If it grows at a minimum of 7%, you can at least get 200 million people out of poverty in the next 20 years. But it needs that kind of growth for that to happen. But efforts are being made, uh, not enough, but efforts are being made towards that. We have two more questions here, then we're going to go to the other side. Okay, thank you. To what extent would you say that corruption impedes progress of democracy and the economy? You know, corruption, um, Corruption is a fact of life. I mean, it, the problem has become that Indians have now accepted it just as a fact of life. And when I talk to business people, they say it's a cost of doing business in India. And to me, I don't think that's the right answer. The right answer is that's not the way to do business in India. But again, it's going to take a generational change because what has happened is now corruption is from bottom, is from grassroots all the way up and from top to the bottom. And if you're honest, it's a hard living to make out there. But when you look at the companies like Tata, which is a real icon in, in, in India, they have a policy, they will never pay a bribe. And they've still survived and become one of India's largest businesses. So it's a question of awareness, but it is also a question of the rest of the world saying to countries, and it's not India alone which takes, uh, I would say, the Olympics for corruption in other countries that we are not going to do business in this kind of an environment. And I think because today we are all connected, you will start seeing results happening because we have laws that we have lived with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, just like Europeans do. And so I think the messages need to be sent, and but it will all come down to education and awareness. And as the economy grows, I think people are going to realize why do I need to go through the channel when I can make a decent living doing it the right way. Thank you very much for coming here with a very informative talk. Uh, I'll try to put you on the spot a little bit. You made reference to independence and to Kashmir. Uh, at the time that Lord Mountbatten was in there negotiating the independence, at the last moment of the matter of Kashmir was raised, and he was out of time, he asked the Hindu leaders if they would hold a vote in Kashmir. They said they would. Uh, they never had it 62 years later. Uh, since that time, there have been 16 United Nations Security Council resolutions telling India to hold a vote in Kashmir. Uh, over the years, as you know, India has put the biggest army per capita population in Kashmir. That's according to the International Strategic Studies in London. Uh, many of the people that American soldiers are now losing their lives to, the Al-Qaeda, were trained and fought in Kashmir, 
and then they went over to Pakistan and to Afghanistan. Uh, do you see any of this as a result of India's policy, and do you think India will ever hold a vote in Kashmir? Uh, that's a very good question. Now, I can give you my view, which might not necessarily agree with yours. Um, Kash Jammu and Kashmir, it's those two states, have had elections. Um, they recently had elections about a year ago, and they've had elections before then. And the par the parties have changed. It's not the ruling party that's uh, won. It's Omar Abdullah, who is um, a Kashmiri, who has won the elections. And the question is, is it a heavily militarized uh, region? Yes, because India's view is if they let Kashmir go, then basically all other parts of India, because then Tamil Nadu will want independence, Assam is going to want independence, Nagaland is going to want independence. India will never let that ever happen um, with Kashmir. But Kashmir has had uh, free elections. Have there been violence? Has there been military? Yes. But it is like Palestine. To me, it's an intractable problem, uh, which needs leadership from both sides. It needs the Pakistanis, the Indians, and actually the people of Kashmir to decide because there is nothing like free Kashmir really because they are landlocked. Where, where is the free Kashmir? And, um, but I think the uh, solution to that is way above my table. That's all I can say to you. The next question is here. In one of your earlier slides, uh, I think it indicated, if I recall, 60% of the population is agriculture. That runs 16% of the GDP of GDP. In the latest uh, edition of The Economist, there was an editorial which was challenging the Indian government to address that problem. They didn't have those statistics. But uh, I'd, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts and comments on that. See, agriculture is a very political issue. Uh, right before the last elections, a year before the elections, uh, the Congress party basically said we will waive uh, uh, loans to all farmers because 60% of the population lives in villages and they vote. People in cities in India unfortunately don't vote. And they also get a lot of subsidies. If you notice, agriculture per yield in India has dropped down from the Green Revolution because of the subsidization of uh, the farms. So what is happening now is the next generation of the farmer doesn't want to stay on the farm. He wants to be in the city because he wants to work and be like this lady in the call center or you know, not the snake channel maybe, but uh, the nano. Well, so the next generation of farmers are not coming in. 300 million Indians will move from villages to cities in the next 30 years. India better have housing, water, energy ready for them. 300 million people are going to migrate from cities because farmers are not able to make their means. And the ones who are getting, are being able to afford it is because the government is subsidizing them to a certain extent. And India needs to really take the politics away from the policy. And we do this in this country too is we have sometimes subsidies uh, for farmers, for agriculture, but it's a very political issue here. It's a very highly political because those farmers are votes to a political party. Thank you. Next question's in the back. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, economic growth is, of course, the way out of poverty. And 7% uh, is a pretty healthy rate. But how free is the economy, as in free market, both internally and uh, externally for foreign, com foreign companies to come in there? You know, that's a very good question. The idea that when I talk to Indians, we take delegations of governors and trade missions, etc., and we talk about you need to open up your economy, we need to open up your economy. And their perspective is the American model of open economy is not going to work here. We are opening it up piece by piece by piece because we have a lot of different issues to take care of. But when you look at the telecom sector, look at the, the phone, you know, Sanjay Jha talked about taking two years, I have experience of 10 years. India today, 
15 million new cell phone users every month. They have 514 uh, million cell phone users today, and they will get up to 700 million in the next five years. So that is an industry that is wide open. Insurance is open to a certain extent. Banking is open to a certain extent, but it is not going to be like this. They're going to take the time. You're talking about a closed economy, and they're slowly, slowly, slowly opening it up. Uh, airlines and all those other things. So I think, um, obviously, unlike China, India has its own compulsions. Uh, is it a 100% open economy? I wouldn't say so. But I think if a company is looking to do business, and if it finds the right partner, because Indians are very entrepreneurial, you will find an opportunity today with 500 million people who are below the age of 25. I mean, McDonald's is like an event out there. I mean, you go to McDonald's and it's got like 300 people sitting out there. It's, it's incredible. So uh, it's not there as we are here, but it's getting there. Thank you. Next question. What's the status of family planning at, at this point? Status of which? Family planning. Uh, family planning, as I said, I, th I thought the graph you know, kind of showed you that Indians don't believe in family planning. They're kind of hitting 1.6 billion somewhere along the way. And they're saying that um, these are 1 billion opportunities. But the irony is the birth rate of people in the cities now is the same as in the Western countries. It's in actually in the rural areas where you see a much higher birth rate. But when you go to urban cities, the cities like Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, Bangalore, it's the same birth rate that you have in our cities here. But it's in the villages is where you still have those higher birth rate. What is the state of art in? You said the priority would be education, education, education. How is India addressing that, or what is happening in that area? You know, um, India has uh, a few years ago started a program called the National uh, Education Act, where they're basically saying that if you are below a certain economic poverty line, you have free education up to high school. So they're trying to provide education, but you also have to provide electricity so people can get educated. So it's got all these challenges that they're trying to address, but definitely the emphasis on making sure that education is available for all Indians is very much there. But like I said, there are other challenges of providing electricity, water, and everything else, because a school without a teacher is no good, a school without electricity is no good too. But I think they are making that effort and now vocational institutes and community colleges, well, I'm calling them community, community college-like institutions are opening up because what India today needs is not really more IT workers. They need professional masons, carpenters, construction workers because all this infrastructure that is going in, you have all these people moving from the farmlands, teach them to be professional masons, carpenters, and you will increase the income potential substantially. So you are starting to see ITI, ITT, all those other institutes are now making the forward there. What is the uh, status in the nuclear area in India? Uh, one, in the military, and two, is uh, I don't see too much um, generation of electric power by uh, nuclear reactors in India. Um, the status of, um, your question was, what is the status of the nuclear reactors in India? You know, they signed the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Agreement, so now India can obviously procure uranium and other materials, which, and India has announced plans to set up 20 nuclear plants in the next five years. So it's going to build 20 nuclear plants in the next five years, and there's a massive investment happening. Four of them are going to be built by Americans. So that is one uh, way they're addressing the problem. The other area is they're going after renewable energy. The emphasis is big for them on uh, solar and uh, wind because India has a company that is the fourth largest maker of wind turbines in the world. And they're also going after solar energy. But India is still predominantly a coal, um, just like we are here, uh, country. But I think nuclear is something that they're really aggressively going after now. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Hi. Uh, you mentioned that you have 150 million Muslims uh, in India. Are there any ideas or suggestions uh, that uh, you could suggest to the United States how we could live uh, or get along more readily with the Muslim population in the world? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we have. If you're talking about the United States here, yeah, I think we get along fairly well with the Muslim population in the United States. Um, the dimensions are much bigger in India. 150 million people is more Muslim than any other country except Indonesia. I mean, there's no Middle Eastern country that has more Muslims. India has the second largest Shiite population in the world after Iran. So, I mean, if you just consider the magnitude of the numbers, it, it is mind-boggling. But they are all living to a large extent, not all the time, but they're all living in peace. And the message is really, no, I would say not for the United States because United States is a multicultural, multi-religious entity, but it is also for the rest of the world. Countries like France have 15% population. They're already having challenges. When you fast forward into the future for Germany, which has a large Turkish population, they're going to have challenges. You look at the Swiss, who had this whole issue with the minarets and things like that. The choices and the challenges they are facing, but also the messages for Muslim countries themselves, that maybe there is a middle ground somewhere to live and to let, let, uh, to let live. And I think that's what is happening because the Muslims in India are a little bit different, I think. Again, I, I'm not a Muslim, so I don't intend to speak for the 150 uh, million Muslims, but it's all one whether you know tomorrow there's a Muslim prime minister or the you know the number one actor or the number one actress is Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist nobody backs an island and I think that's how it should be for the rest of the world too what single thought would you like to leave with us tonight <laughs> What single thought? Well, the, I think I kind of started with the thought and I'll end with that thought is there are a lot of stereotypes about India. But to me, and again, this is my bias here, there's a lot of goodness of the people of India. And I think the success of that country will be important for our way of life and for the rest of the way of life the world because I see the biggest danger not yes we're going through an economic meltdown we're going through all kinds of challenges but this country is resilient enough to come back from all those challenges we've been through many many others and we always find a way out but our way of life can be impacted by intolerance by others I think if India can be used as an example to point to others to educate others I think I would say is for you to just pay attention and maybe just see if, because I think we all have a vested stake in the success of India. And my message would be that India matters to you um, and to me and to the rest of the world. Not because it's going to have you know, one out of five people, not in this room, because it's going to be in India, but for other reasons, I think India matters. So that's the message. Nice. Thank you. Thank you.